All right, looks like we are live tonight on the live stream show. So before we get to tonight's show topic, there's a lot of interesting things going on in the stock market and with the VIX, the volatility index. The VIX is back up to 40. It is above 40. There was a 20% spike today on Wednesday, October 28th. So that is a very big spike. I was going to say a couple days ago, I, but I didn't cover the stock market and the VIX on any of the live stream shows, that if the VIX gets to 40, stays above 40, even goes higher, it's going to signal that the it's going to increase the probability of a stock market crash. And really, in my opinion, what this is, is a temper tantrum from Wall Street that the QE drip has slowed down. That's what it is. It's the amount of stimulus, the amount of uh, MMT QE checks, the amount of avail available stimulus injections into markets, and I'm using air quotes here because we don't have markets here at this point. We only have bailouts, manipulations, and rules changes. We don't have real markets anymore. I mean, Main Street businesses are allowed to fail, but not large corporations. So large publicly traded corporations are allowed to get away with accounting fraud and a bunch of other nonsense, financial engineering, a bunch of other, and then they get bailouts. Or the government uh, gives them an unbidded government contract, protects them from competition, bunch of bunch of other shenanigans. But if the if this continues with the VIX, it's going to increase the probability of a stock market crash. Now there was in in the next six weeks. Now um, a member of Congress was on Fox News earlier this week talking about how the vote for a next uh, stimulus bill, fiscal stimulus, might not occur until February. If that is the case, if Congress does actually fumble this and screw this up with a delay until February, then the probability of another stock market crash does increase further. However, we have uh, New York Fed President Bill Dudley doing op-eds, talking about how the Fed's out of ammo. Meanwhile, Mr. Hypocrite here, Bill Dudley, former Goldman Sachs, and in just like all around globalists like Larry Summers and others. Uh, he worked at Goldman Sachs. He, I think he worked at Harvard too before going to the New York Fed. So, you know, the normal circuit, the normal circle jerk circuit <laughs> of, of operations there that the financial and political elites tend to operate in. Um, he just released a recent op-ed saying the Fed is out of ammo, but only at the end of June, he was saying, the Fed's balance sheet's going to $10 trillion is no, no big deal. Well, the Fed's balance sheet is going to have to go a lot higher. It is guaranteed. Okay, the U.S. federal government budget deficits, a lot of them are going to get monetized. There is not net foreigner demand for U.S. treasuries. The pension funds are soaked up. The banks can buy probably, the large banks can probably buy some more. But overall, the, the entities that were buying a lot of treasuries in the past are not buying them. And the amount of tax revenues that are going to be coming in, especially if asset prices fall for the U.S. Treasury, are going to be very, very low. So the Fed's balance sheet, I think there's a misinformation campaign going now because I think we're getting very, very close, if not in the next couple weeks, definitely in the next couple months, where we're going to see weeks on the Fed's official balance sheet where the Fed's official balance sheet is going up $100 billion per week or more. So we're going to see that the Fed's been buying um, corporate bonds because look at all the corporate bonds and junk bond investment grade corporate bonds. What a joke because of the ratings agencies. Investment grade corporate bond. The ratings agencies won't downgrade them. Invest, uh, investment grade in air quotes here. Corporate bonds, junk bonds, leverage loans, collateralized loan obligations, commercial real estate mortgage backed securities. And then on top of that, you have all these federal government budget deficits here in D.C., that the federal government's not really going to cut back. Trump just said that the mil he did a speech in the last couple weeks saying the military, he invested $2.5 trillion in additional military spending. Well, that didn't really appear in the budget. So I'm guessing that that was off balance sheet and wasn't counted. So there's all, just go down the list. There's all these different things that the Fed is going to have to fund that the misinformation campaign is trying to tell you that the Fed can't do it. But the Fed, when it comes to quantitative easing and and paying 100 cents on the dollar or more for financial assets and making sure the billionaires on Wall Street get theirs, get rich or get richer, either stay rich or get richer with the wealth transfer 
transfer with the Cantillon effect, the Fed is there for them. The Fed will take care of the large banks. The Fed will take care of the hedge funds. The Fed will take care of monetizing the federal bu uh, federal government budget deficits. But the dollar has the dollar index went up a little bit, and you're hearing all these dollar bulls, Robert Q. Saki. Um, Raul Powell, Brent Johnson, talking about this big dollar rally that's going to come. And I'm still in the dollar tug of war camp. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So you can see there on your screen a number of the reasons, um, new reasons that have just come out in the last couple weeks. One of them actually is helping prop up the dollar. That's that chart on your screen there, year to date. You can't see all the numbers because I couldn't fit everything there on the screen. It was just really difficult for me to put everything together on the screen there. So if you want to see that chart, the full chart is on Daniel Lacaye's Twitter feed or in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group. But there's six currencies against the dollar that are down 14% or more year to date. So the Indonesian rupiah, the Colombian peso, the Mexican peso, the Brazilian real, which is down um, over 19%, almost 20%. I haven't checked. This, this chart's about a week old. And then the South African rand and the Russian ruble, which are both down over 20%. And when these currencies are down that much, the next effect that you can see there is what happened, the devalued currency against the dollar and the way the system works. And I've kind of highlighted it there with some circles and some bubbles. And I have to work on trying to integrate this theory more. But George Gammon did a really good video recently about Triffin's Dilemma. And Triffin's Dilemma is where the U.S. has to run permanent budget deficits and the U.S. gets to export dollars in world trade. And that's the way the global financial system is set up on a dollar standard. And that helps prop up the dollar. But you also have other things there that help prop up the dollar. So you have dollar pegs, which there's, according to this article, there's 66 different countries that peg their currencies against the dollar. And that means that they're accumulating lots and lots of dollars as reserves. So there's artificial, any country that runs a dollar peg, whether that's a Hong Kong dollar peg or other countries are have accumulated or are still accumulating massive amounts of U.S. dollars. Now that allows the U.S. government to export a lot of this monetary inflation for decades now out of the United States. And yes, we've exported inflation. However, the way the system works is a lot of these other countries are copying the U.S.'s monetary policy that are running dollar pegs or trying to maintain an exchange rate, a foreign exchange rate, in a certain ban. So they're going to try to devalue their currencies against the dollar. So this is what Jim Rickards, we get then into what Jim Rickards calls a currency war, where other countries are trying to get their currency because they see that the U.S. is trying to weaken the dollar, but the dollar is in the tug of war. So the U.S. Treasury, the Fed, cannot weaken the dollar as much as they want. They cannot rapidly devalue the dollar. And yes, the dollar has been devalued a lot since the Federal Reserve has been created. But here's the thing with currencies. They can devalue the dollar. They can devalue the dollar another 50%. And then after, this is in theory. And then after that, they can devalue it, devalue it even more as long as foreigners and other people will accept the currency. So in theory, they can continue to this devaluation process. And this is the problem with all fiat currencies and why up until the 1971, when President Richard Nixon uh, eliminated the international gold standard, he defaulted and went to a full fiat currency dollar standard. So before that, we had Bretton Woods and all currencies were pegged to the dollar and the dollar was pegged to gold. So that's why so many currencies were pegged to the dollar initially after World War II with Bretton Woods, but we've had a lot of other countries with the help of the U.S. Milton Friedman actually, I think, was pretty big on this, was pegging currencies to the dollar. And I think uh, Professor Steve Hankey also, he's talked about this in a lot of interviews. He's talked about how he was hired as a currency expert by the finance ministries and central banks of other countries to help stabilize their currencies after um, financial problems or... Um, hyperinflations or inflationary events in other countries. And then he would peg those currencies to the dollar and it would temporarily fix things. But it's also allowing the U.S. to export this inflation, but then these other monetary inflation, but then these other countries are trying to devalue their currencies against the dollar further. And then we get this, this currency war, this race to debase, where all these other countries are trying to devalue their currencies too. And 
how is that inflationary for Americans? Well, we import here in the United States an enormous amount of goods. Okay, there is very little things now here in the United States that are made in fully in the United States anymore. Even stuff that is stamped made in the United States here is really only assembled in the United States. So a lot of the components that stuff is uh, stamped as made in the United States, all these parts, all these goods and services are being imported. And if other countries, so let's say on that chart there that you can't fully see all the numbers, let's say the Brazilian real, which is year to date approximately down about 20%, 19.77% against the dollar. So when that Brazilian real is devalued that much against the dollar, you're going to start, and the narrative that's in the mainstream financial media, that PhD economists, that Keynesians will repeat is that a weaker currency means that it, the country's economy is going to be more competitive. It's going to boost exports. But what it really does is that weakened currency, any of the goods that that country exports, it starts, the weakened currency starts to leak into the supply chain. So whatever goods that that country is exporting, those goods are going to start to cost more. Okay, that's just how things work. And you can see an example of that on your screen with the Brazilian soybean example, because that's really the best example, because he's talking about the different input costs, uh, some of the different input costs that go into um, producing a good like a soybean. So it's not just energy and transportation cost, it's also, you know, labor costs, and also cost of capital. So if the currency, the Brazilian currency is devaluing rapidly against the dollar and Brazil is exporting a lot of soybeans to other countries, maybe the U.S. is importing some of them, then US, whoever is importing them is going to be paying a higher price. And you see that in the numbers. So this is a complex situation. And this is why neither side so far has been right about that rip your face off dollar rally and also the massive collapse in the dollar excuse me because you have these other countries that are also trying to react to what the u.s is doing especially if they have a dollar peg or are trying to maintain a band a currency band with a certain range the other thing that happened uh and brent johnson by the way i've said this many many times now brent johnson would have been right i've said this in articles from my patrons brent johnson would have been right end of february early march he was definitely going to be right about that dollar spike, but the people in power now, and you can see this from the Fed minutes, they're well aware. It's discussed about a rising dollar rally. It's discussed a lot in the Fed minutes over the last six or seven months. It's also discussed in the Fed's uh, financial, in their uh, market stability, financial stability report that came out, I think, in May. So they discussed it in there. They discussed the rapidly rising dollar, and that is why the global repo facility is in place. That is why the currency swap lines are in place for other trading partners like Brazil and others, because the Fed is well aware of this, that they're, that a uh, rapidly rising dollar, because of the amount of dollar-denominated debt outstanding globally, and also all those dollar liabilities, so all those derivatives, that the forward dollar swaps, which there's at least like $14 trillion, give or take of those, according to the Bank of International Settlements. So there's $26 trillion, give or take, worth of dollar-denominated debt combined with dollar liabilities or the dollar derivatives of forward dollar swaps. That creates demand for dollars. And the Fed is aware of this, and this is why they're trying to prevent that massive rip-your-face-off dollar rally. But the main reason, in my opinion, why Brent Johnson was not right was we had a situation where the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and Congress just changed the rules. And unfortunately, if you study financial history, you see this all the time with powerful governments, powerful economies. When they get in trouble, and this is rule number one, when things get really, really bad and they get in trouble, they just change the rules. So the scenario and, and the way they can do this right now is with currency swap line bailouts. There is little to no transparency, real transparency with currency swap line bailouts. And at this point, the Fed can give out currency swap line bailouts in the trillions and then waive the loans. And I've spoken with Brent Johnson about this on Twitter. And he said, if that is the case, and honestly, that has been the case with the European Central Bank for going on over 10 years now. Because from 2008 to 2010, we were told that the currency swap lines given out were only temporary. 
and that that was over. That's what the Fed's official narrative was. And then we found out from the one-time partial audit that Ron Paul got with both political parties and then the Levy Institute, the uh, Freedom of Information Act request that Bloomberg, in, New, uh, Bloomberg News got and then the Levy Institute went through, that that was a lie from the Fed. And then I found out in a recent Fed report from May, their financial stability report hidden in the footnotes, was a disclosure that the European Central Bank has had permanent currency swap lines since 2013, which they're not supposed to have. And then on top of that, in February and March, the European Central Bank and others got additional currency swap lines. So this is how the people in power at the central banks, at the treasury departments or finance ministries, the people running governments, the high-level bureaucrats, uh, politicians and bureaucrats and central banksters, this is how they cheat. They cheat by changing the rules and then not telling you unless they need to tell you the truth. Most of the time, they don't tell you the truth. So I have a number of articles here about currency pegs, about the dollar peg, how it works, why it's done, how other central bankers in other countries operate a dollar peg, if you want to read more about it. But this is all part of the dollar tug of war and stagflate and tax and lie. Why is it part of that? Because all these governments and central banks are all trying to do pretty much the same thing. At this point, because the economy is not back to anywhere near normal, in fact, we have uh, Dr. Evil there and his James Bond villains at the World Economic Forum. They want to they, <laughs> they want to use this crisis as an opportunity, never let a good crisis go to waste, and they want to do a great reset. They don't want things going back to normal. They don't want normal cash flows because that means no crazy radical change that they can shove down people's throats. But... What the most of these governments, it seems to me, are trying to do are different variations of stagflate tax and lie. And when you have all these other governments all trying to do stagflate tax and lie, and the way the dollar standard system is set up, and the way dollar pegs are set up, that helps create artificial demand for dollars and prop up the dollar. But it's flooding global supply chains with currency devaluations. And those currency devaluations in other countries are leaking into the supply chains of goods and the U.S. is then importing higher costs into the supply chain. And you hear this on conference calls from companies. They're not talking about how all their input costs are lower. You're not hearing companies say all their input costs are lower. Now their oil costs are lower. Natural gas costs were lower until the rally in natural gas. So there are some input costs lower, but for a lot of goods that are manufactured, oil and energy might only be about 30% or, or a third of all the input costs. There's a lot of other input costs. So there's energy, labor, cost of capital. There's all these different things that go into producing a good or service. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. A lot of financial professional make. A lot of financial professionals make. Anthony says a Patreon article on a podcast tonight. That's because I'm feeling pretty good. That's because the nootropics and the supplements are actually working. They actually, the the worst the worst um, health problems I get are doing the live stream shows because uh, normally like with the, some of the super chat questions are hedge fund manager difficult stuff, stuff hedge fund managers can't even answer with a couple weeks or a couple months of preparation. That's how difficult the questions are for a couple bucks. Okay, we have a super chat question from Sean Cole. Thank you for the $8 super chat. He is a longtime podcast listener, but he is not a Patreon account contributor. He should be. Uh, so I can't say he's one of over a thousand, one of over a thousand per month, chipping in five bucks a month, because YouTube is screwing me over financially, and the YouTube views counter is still frozen at the same number it was almost three weeks ago. Now it's over two weeks now. Good job, YouTube. Thank you for the censorship, making sure I can can't really grow my channel, can't add new subscribers, and the view count's not growing. At least I'm getting a little bit of ad revenues, a tiny amount. Okay, Sean says, haven't seen you live in a long time. Will the U.S. dollar index hit 95 this year? Yes, it's very possible the U.S. dollar index can hit 95. I'm just saying that that they won't allow it above like that 103, 104 number. That's my thesis with the dollar tug of war. So keeping the dollar index in a trading range between, I don't know, maybe 88. Maybe they let it go a little below 90, maybe 88. Seem to be pretty strong support levels in the charts there from years ago. 88 and maybe 96 or 97. 
and it can bounce around in there. And I think the U.S. Treasury and the Fed would be okay with that. But basically, and Brent Johnson has admitted this, and I'm, I'm friends with Brent. I respect him. Brent would have been right if there wasn't rules changes and intervention and and God knows how many extra currency swap lines. I mean, they issued tons and tons of press releases mid to late February and March of this year. So many press releases. And yes, Jeffrey Snyder is right. They didn't actually have to buy a lot of stuff, but they still manipulated all these markets. I mean, they still accomplished their goals. Their goals are to move markets, the bond market, the currency markets on exchange rate, the stock market, uh, President Trump tweeting. Their goals are to move these markets however, in whichever direction they want. So the dollar index has actually been range bound in a trading range for about five years now. It hasn't really done very much. But you have these other currencies against the dollar and they've been weak. And a lot of these currencies are either dependent on exporting to China, higher commodity prices, normally with energy and base metals, or they have too much dollar denominated debt or a combination of those three. And they've also had net capital outflows. There's been a lot of net capital outflows out of emerging markets for a couple of years now coming into the U.S. You're still seeing net capital inflows coming into the U.S. in certain stocks and um, bonds too. On a relative basis, U.S. bonds still have a positive yield. Daniel DiMartino Booth has talked about this. So not counting a real inflation rate, if you look at U.S. treasuries relative to other treasuries in Europe or other countries, the U.S. still has a positive yield. So professional bond fund managers and family offices and hedge funds, that's why they're buying treasuries. So a dollar index to 95 wouldn't be that big a move. You're going to see though, like the dollar bulls, you're going to see them start to promote that. Like Robert Kiyosaki just put out a tweet saying the dollar is going to have a rip your face off rally. I don't think he understands anything of what I'm saying. He has Brent Johnson on though, like every couple weeks and Marin Katusa on every couple weeks. So all those things are factoring in, in the little circles there, the little charts. I haven't figured out how to simplify things and connect everything, but it's all these governments doing stagflate and tax and lie. The current global financial system of global trade is based on a dollar standard, and that creates artificial demand for dollars. And we have the Fed, the U.S. Treasury, who want to rapidly weaken the dollar. President Trump has tweeted a lot about wanting to rapidly weaken the dollar, and they can't do it for a bunch of different reasons. And part of those is because other countries are running dollar pegs and you have other currencies falling against the dollar. And if other currencies fall, the dollar is not going to fall too. It's not going to fall as fast, excuse me. So the dollar on a relative basis of other currencies, like the currencies you can see there on your charts, so on the chart there. So um, Turkish Lira, Thai Bot, Hungarian Forint, Czech Karuna, Chilean peso, Indonesian rupiah, Colombian peso, Mexican peso, Brazilian real, South African rand, Russian ruble. So the dollar is going to look really strong against all those other currencies that I just mentioned. And that's how the relative currency game is played. So then you might have some global macro traders then move more funds to the U.S. They're going to go to U.S. bonds. Although it looks like probably not to corporate, not probably not to corporate bonds and junk bonds. So the Fed's going to have to buy those. There's no cash flow to support a lot of the bonds that that have been sold. The Fed's going to have to buy those for sure. Or they're going to have to find another sucker. Maybe the Fed will create another one of these off balance sheet entities. Be a new special purpose vehicle, a new off balance sheet entity for the Fed to stuff them, and the Fed won't count it as on their balance sheet. You know, I think there's a lot of games being played right now over what's technically on the Fed's balance sheet. I think the Fed is setting up a lot of special purpose vehicles, and there's a lot of stuff they've been buying the last six to seven months that are technically off the Fed's balance sheet. And this is a lawyer's game. So they're technically off the Fed's balance sheet, but they're really 
in reality on the Fed's balance sheet, but the Fed is not counting them, and that's why the Fed gets to say its official balance sheet is still not even $7.2 trillion yet. Okay, well, that's enough for this live stream show. I want to thank everyone for listening. Thank you very much to the $50 Super Chat from EPR Paradox. I really appreciate it. Prowess, he says. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the $50 Super Chats. Much appreciated. Thank you very much to Justin March for the $5 Super Chat. He is one of over a 1,000 monthly pay Patreon account contributors. There is a new oil article out about warning again because I've been warning now for the last like four or five months, warning uh, dividend income investors about going into the oil market, about pipeline stocks. And we just had a major master limited partnership pipeline stock company just out of nowhere days before their earnings announcement, slash their dividend in 50%. It's going to get nasty out there. And uh, I'm really worried. I've been talking about this for a while, and I'm really, really worried about ExxonMobil. Uh, I think for the first time in more than 18 years, probably they're going to have to cut their dividend. But we'll see. And I've n I have not been bullish on that stock in a long time because of the financial engineering that's gone on and the debt that they loaded that balance sheet with. So if you made a lot of money in a few months trading ExxonMobil and it went up on an oil price rally, congratulations. I hope you sold that stock because I'm not liking what's coming soon with ExxonMobil. So uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll see what's the, we'll see what's gonna come, but watch the VIX. So if the VIX continues higher, 40, 50, if it gets to 50 or 60, the odds of a stock market crash are going to go very, very high. Don't be shocked if you start to see the people in Congress then start to move up the meetings. Because I can tell you right now, the people in Congress are dragging their feet. And maybe in the next couple of weeks, they won't. <laughs> they don't want to give President Trump a win. So I think that was part of it. Because there's, um, in terms of polling, there's lots of Americans that want these uh, checks as a handout. So it's been very popular in polling for Americans to get checks. But the Democrats in the House of Representatives and the Senate did not want to give President Trump a win that he could use for the election. So um, the guy, on, the congressman on Fox News said they might not vote on the next stimulus, um, fiscal stimulus for the Congress until February. I don't think so. Because if it takes that long, we're probably going to have a stock market crash. The VIX is definitely signaling, is definitely having a temper tantrum. It's a Wall Street hedge fund investment bankster temper tantrum. Not the taper tantrum like my friend Grant Williams came up with. Because this, this, this isn't really a taper. The Fed's balance sheet is starting to grow again. Okay, I think the days of the Fed's balance sheet net declining, the fake net declining that were that was happening the last like three or four months where the Fed was pretending, oh, we're not increasing our balance sheet that much. We're going to take a little break. I think those days are done. I think the Fed's balance sheet with all the bad debt so that's whether that's uh, corporate bond debt, junk bond debt, uh, U.S. Treasuries that the Fed is going to have to monetize and there's no foreign demand for. Um, you have municipal bond debt, which is going to go bad. You have all this debt, and I don't think there's demand for it. Well, guess who steps in to buy all those financial assets and then tells us it's not inflationary? But we know with the Cantillon effect and studying the Austrian School of Economics, it is that there's asset price inflation. Asset price inflation, propping up asset prices, is inflation. Just pretend they just pretend it's not. Okay, thank you, James, for the ten dollars super chat here. So I got one more super chat. He says, "Even more interesting times ahead." Uh, excuse me. James says, "Even more interesting times ahead." Yes, I agree because we've had our our Federal Reserve relief rally and why the while. The stock market was still crashing in February and March. I was writing articles about my patron uh, for my patrons that even though the stock market was still crashing and I was looking for companies and industries that were going to have problems, I was I was going to say the Fed was going to figure out the right combination of manipulation, intervention, bailouts, and rules changes to get a stock market rally. This is just how much of a joke our currency and credit system is, our creditism, and the casino system that the Fed is operating. So you knew there was going to be a rally, but now here's the problem. They sold all these bonds, 
all these corporate bonds, junk bonds, leverage loans, collateralized loan obligations since the first week of April. And guess what? There's There was very little cash flow before the pandemic to service the existing corporate bond bubble before all this debt was sold. And now here, they just piled on $2 trillion more debt and now there's even now there's little or no cash flow. So who's going to get stuck buying this buying these bad bonds? Because if these bonds go to zero, what the pension funds are in trouble, the Wall Street banks, the hedge funds that leveraged up in these trades, hopefully they dumped them already or the hedge funds are going to need bailouts. What a mess. But this is all the Fed's fault. You got to blame the Fed. The, the majority of this is on the central banksters and the Fed and big government because government's not going to eat even in a depression or pandemic that we have now the federal government's not cutting back they're going to grow size they're talking about increasing taxes on us on pretty much everything and they're going to be going after asset prices there'll probably be a value added tax too in the next couple of years i know andrew yang when he was running for uh president on the democrat side he was talking about 10 percent value added tax i would not be shocked if there is a value out of tax in the not-too-distant future, too.